All right, uh, thank you everyone for attending the webinar today, and I'm just going to let Mike jump right in. Go ahead, Mike, thanks. Hi, all. So, my name is Mike Derby. I'm the founder uh, and CTO here at Avalon Wireless, and today we're just going to talk a bit about 5.8 and the other options available for doing wireless Ethernet systems. Um, this is a, a quick heads up, uh, Avalon is uh, about an 11-year-old company, and we're located here in, in Huntsville, Alabama, and we've sold someplace uh, in excess of about 70,000 uh, wireless Ethernet systems over those last 11 years. So we've uh, we've been around a little while, and just just as a that's just a quick backgrounder um, on the company. All right, well, well let me just just jump right in here. Um, so what we've found. Um, it, and along the way, if anyone has any questions, there's a chat window down at the bottom. And as we go through, I'll try and uh, merge the uh, the questions uh, into any sort of responses that uh, they give on the slides as we go. Okay. So in the industrial, municipal, and commercial projects, they, they really require performance that's a step above uh, the uh, the average uh, consumer or uh, or what would even be called a WISP type operator. They, they need a performance that's truly not just reliable for today, but it's got to keep working for tomorrow and, and literally for years to come. A lot of these projects have a you know, five year to 10 year operating window for, uh, for its performance and, and often even contractual obligation for, uh, by the integrator or by a contract to, uh, to maintain and keep it going. So, reliability and profitability on projects, it absolutely has to work, and it's a different performance uh, requirement. Um, so what we find is that powerful, truly professional grade reliabilities are the only way to really get that the, the, the most out of the range, most out of the reliability uh, in order to service these kind of uh, opportunities. So with that, let me keep uh, uh, going. Um, so before you begin any wireless installation, it, it, it really is a great idea just to, to sit down and, and really look at the, at the design and, and say, all right, how fast is truly fast enough? Uh, whenever you're dealing with wireless, the faster you go, it becomes a little bit uh, more challenging to, uh, to get that reliability. Uh, I've got a slide closer to the end um, on that. But what is the, what's the real distance that we're going? What kind of obstructions are in the way uh, that makes a lot of... Uh, uh, challenges when you're trying to figure out what the uh, right topology is and also what the right frequency to use is. Um, you know, there's a lot of different uh, uh, techniques. You can use backhauls, multiple access and repeater solutions. Uh, you know, how exactly is the security handled? How easy is it to set up? And then lastly, we'll talk about how do I get a radio to robust, robustly go uh, you know, the, the, the longest distance it's possible. All right. So when you're actually looking at a system, quite often we have folks giving us a call and saying, hey, I need uh, gigabit wireless speeds, but uh, often they then come back and say, well, I've got four cameras. <laughs> and uh, uh, and it's, always a, it's always an interesting mixture. Um, sometimes it's uh, you know, just the opposite where they say I've got 40 cameras and they you may not have an awareness of the data rate. But it's really important to scope out what, what is the actual data rate that's required. Um, is it you know what what realistically we're we looking at and then as as you design some of the systems it's a matter of uh, of saying well what's my what's my actual usable upstream in case I'm trying to monitor these uh, maybe a video system or even uh, you know a data system if your internet system if your internet provider might be uh, anything from cable modem to uh, to I don't know T1 or cellular. Often they like to quote download speeds at 50 or 100 megabit per second, but the, the fine print might say that it only does five uplink or half a megabit per second if it's you know a DSL slash cable modem, uh, maybe even slower if it's cellular, because a lot of these systems are very, very optimized for download speeds rather than upload speeds. And when you put a, a camera or other thing, uh, you know, network thing rather than, you know, can, 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 user that would normally be surfing the internet, now you're trying to surf this thing, and, uh, and it's a very different design uh, mentality, so, you know, you want to think about that in terms of bottlenecking uh, in the system, and make sure the design is, 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 uh, is not going 500 megabit per second when you only have a 5 megabit per second uplink pipe that, uh, that will actually be used for monitoring 
the, uh, the the installation. And again, access control. There's there's a lot of little data apps that you see out there in the security, surveillance, and, and whatnot that also just need very, very tiny uh, bits of data. Okay, so the different frequency choices that you have out there, uh, unless you're a military user, um, and they can do all sorts of things, but if you're, if you're a regular uh, U.S. citizen, uh, you've got a couple of options here, and the bands that you have to work with uh, is really, you know, 5.8 gigahertz, and often that's, uh, you know, like this presentation is all about this, that's often your, your best case and your best weapon uh, for getting most of the applications that we see done. Uh, particularly, it's very fast, and with, uh, with some of the design optimizations that we use, and, and I suppose maybe uh, is available otherwise, but very much so in how we've optimized our radio uh, system, it's, it's not Wi-Fi, uh, it's really designed to, uh, to, to, well, be a little bit more rude. Wi-Fi is a very, very friendly uh, IEEE radio standard that, that requires all the radios that operate in the Wi-Fi protocol to, uh, to, be, uh, to, to listen first before they talk, and if there's somebody else talking, then they back off and back off and back off till they can finally find a quiet moment to, uh, to send their data. Well, that's very nice and all, but when you're sending video type systems for municipalities and, and other type of uh, applications, you really don't want to be all that friendly and all that patient. So our radios are designed to uh, to really hop on the air and stay on the air and somewhat dominate on that uh, piece of unlicensed spectrum that they're operating in. And that's uh, particularly useful um, in that regard, and that's one of the professional grade differentiators that, uh, that you start looking for are systems that are truly hardened, uh, both RF-wise and uh, and you know weather-wise and whatnot. But that's kind of the, the the idea and the noise mitigation techniques that you can look for uh, in five eight systems. It is unlicensed spectrum, so it can be deployed straight away, and there are very high power outdoor grade equipment that will go full on to the one watt legal max uh, transmit power uh, that the FCC allows, and you can even get systems that are up to a couple hundred watts of directional power, and we'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment. So your other spectral choice is 4.9. Now this is a, a public safety band that the FCC carved out. It's, a, it's about one quarter of the amount of spectrum that's available in the 5 gig unlicensed band. So believe it or not, that's a lot of spectrum, because this is only, this is 50 megahertz uh, that's reserved only for public safety users. So all sorts of folks can qualify for this. Um, we actually gave a presentation on it last week, and we're happy to chat with the folks uh, in detail on it. But the licensing steps are quite straightforward. Uh, if you're doing this for a city project, anything from wastewater to you know fire, ambulance, police, and even if it's an uh, even if it's a university, state university is doing it for their camera system. As long as it's uh, it's public safety related, uh, you can go and you can qualify. And non-government uh, entities can actually just request from their local police department a uh, a sharing agreement, just a one-page memo that just says, "Hey, you're allowed to use uh, this for your." Uh, electric grid, uh, private electric grid operator, for example. Um, so it's it's quite straightforward, and it's actually quite easy to get that license. And it usually takes about 48 hours, and it's free of charge for the municipality that's sponsoring the local user, or if they're doing it for themselves, it's free of charge. Uh, it just requires filling out uh, an online form with the FCC, and again, we we offer a little webinar and training service, uh, training support, if you will, on how to do that. It's uh, so that's that's always an option for those kind of applications. Um, two four, just don't use it um, in anything commercial grade unless you're deploying Wi-Fi access points, which this presentation and Avalan products aren't anything about. But unless you're really just trying to install Wi-Fi at a hotel or whatnot, just just stay away. And then 900 megahertz, it's really a terrific band uh, for those non line of sight applications, like you see in the picture here. You know, when you've got to go uh, burning through some trees, you need to burn around uh, obstacles. 900 megahertz is really a great way of doing it. The downside is it is a little, it's a, it's, it's a slower slice of spectrum. It's a narrower piece of spectrum, it's, and, and therefore, there's only so much data rate you're going to get through it. Um, and the FCC rules really are, are tight in that regard. Um, if you want to go really slow, uh, you can go really, really crazy distances through a bunch of stuff that's in the way, 
but you, the penalty you pay is, is the slower data rate. And what you find is this 900 megahertz band is often used for data services, like turning on and off uh, pumps and uh, municipal water, wastewater systems or whatnot. It's used for all sorts of uh, industrial applications that are just basic data. You know, those 9600 baud um, uh, bit on, bit off things that you're turning the lighting systems on and other, other very modest data rate uh, connections. And it's shocking, it, it wasn't that many years ago that a megabit per second was an amazingly fast download speed. I mean, that's like a T1. But nowadays, uh, for those video applications, it's a bit on the slow side unless you really just want moving pictures. Um, and moving pictures could be anything from you know one frame per minute if you're doing maybe one of those twenty those new twenty nine megapixel monster cams you know all the way up to several frames per second if you're doing a, a D one resolution six forty four eighty at you know uh, MPEG four uh, sorry H two sixty four you'll you'll be in the multi frame per second you know eight five eight frames per second on a one to one camera basis you know one camera so it is still very viable. Uh, it's just got a m more moderated rate that uh, that uh, makes it a little bit more limited in the in the newer video type stuff. Um, so there. So uh, the differences between the different kinds of topologies, and I've got a slide for each one of these. So there really are different different ways of getting things done. We've got backhaul solutions for you know doing direct line, and you use that for point-to-point -point for just maximum speed. It might be between buildings to do that, you know, a, an NVR back to the main headquarters or other types of very, very high-speed stuff. That That's your half a gigabit per second of throughput kind of radio solution. Um, you know, your multiple access, this is when we get into stars, and it really is, it's all about more of a modest range. We've got multiple simultaneous devices all talking back to a, a central node. Uh, this is this is what we sell a lot of is this type of star hardware, and we sell a lot of backhaul solutions as well. But the the star, it's more of a party line, if you will. Um, if you think about, you know, back in the old days, I lived on a county road, and and we all shared the same telephone line, and you'd pick up, and your neighbors would be on the line. Well, you had to share, and this is where our our radios are still very very effective because everybody gets a an equal opportunity to uh, to utilize that phone unlike uh, the people down the street from us that would never get off the phone. And, uh, and it made it real tricky. That's kind of like the, the, the classic Wi-Fi model where you have to wait and you have to be polite and you, and you don't want to make your neighbors mad. And you keep waiting and waiting and waiting before you can get on in case you have a real busy party line mechanism. And that's your 802.11 based concepts. Well, we kind of this give this guaranteed mechanism where all the neighbors truly do uh, coordinate and that is you know, they have a guaranteed mechanism that they're always there and it makes for excellent uh, quality of service or video type of for video type or you know, even data type of services but um, it still is kind of a nice analogy with the, with the old party line phone uh, system so the next kind is is a new product that we're coming out with uh, and there's a there's a few others but it's called a re, you know more of a repeater um, not necessarily mesh, but what what we really have is a repeater. It's a straightforward mechanism where we're able to bounce data between a, a number of nodes at, at, generally speaking, moderate to short distances. It's because you're using omnidirectional antennas, um, you know, whip antennas or what have you, between the different uh, nodes, and that really does cut down on the uh, on the uh, distance that's going to be usable. But the great thing is is that it, it actually allows for some flexibility, so you can go node to node to node. Um, but we really try and uh, are make, making uh, marketing and recommendations to keep in mind that it's 10 nodes or less if it's video systems, you know, to, to maintain a moderation in, uh, in the expectations that might be set for the end user. I think a lot of folks have seen mesh systems, which you see on the next thing here. You know, it's often been shown to be a very poor choice for video delivery, particularly, you know, the number of, of, of quite uh, uh, famous tear outs that you've seen throughout the years, you know, the failure kind of and wind down of Fire Tide and others, you know, that took on gobs of venture money and had gobs of tear outs and, and lots of challenges. It's really shown that uh, full blown mesh mega video systems have, have, have really, really had just a, a nightmarish problem trying to, to, to get stability and, uh, and performance that uh, a lot of the hype has been out around the years, so we're we're going with the with a with a simpler repeater type mechanism that works beautiful. You know, it's working beautifully, and that product is coming out here very very shortly. Okay, um, so when you're thinking about 
these different radios and point to points and multi points and antennas, one of the things that sometimes is a misconfusion is that, oh, the antenna is creating all this power. Look, it's 200 watts of transmit power. Well, no, it's still, let's say it's still one watt of transmit power. It's like a, it's like a light bulb in your, in your lantern. You know, you can, you can put that one watt light bulb in a lantern and it goes 360 degrees. Or you can put a reflector behind it, like a flashlight. Now, the flashlight's a whole lot brighter. As a matter of fact, when you're looking at it from a distance, it looks really bright. It looks like maybe what would ordinarily be like a 50-watt lantern, but as it turns out, it's still just that one-watt light bulb. It just happens to be pointing straight at you. Um, so it has the perception is all it comes down to. So that that's where you see some of these big numbers. Like somebody will say 200 watts EIRP. That just means you're looking at it, and that's how bright you think it is, even though it might actually just be a one-watt light bulb with a really big reflector behind it pointed straight at you. Well, you can't tell the difference when you're looking at it, which one of those things it is. All you know is that it's, it's, it's super bright, and that's what it means by this, these big numbers, these e, you know, effective isotropic radiated power, EIRP. And all it's telling you is that, hey, it's, it's, it has a perception of this brightness, and that really does translate very much so into the uh, into the range and, and its ability to uh, to likewise hear. So if you think about it, that that same um, reflector that's helping on the flashlight, when you actually reverse the situation and you're trying to collect the uh, the return signal, it behaves very much like a beautiful collector now because it's listening. It's it's got that that fancy lens and it's actually collecting the light energy from the other side. And because it's such a, a an excellent transmit focusing thing. It also makes for a beautiful uh, collector focusing mechanism and, and it works beautifully in that specific direction. And the, and the beauty there is that it doesn't work well in other directions. So if you have other light sources or other noise sources in and around, you don't really care so much because you're focused on your listening in just that one specific direction. So it kind of feels more like a telescope. You're looking in that direction and all the other uh, light around you is, isn't really impairing your ability to, to, to perceive the, the distant object even on a very, very uh, bright kind of environment uh, or noisy environment. So that's kind of what antennas are all about. They're really not at all creating power. They're really, you could call them just like lenses. They are RF lenses um, and, or just different kinds of lantern uh, reflecting ways of, of getting the job done to, uh, to get those directional patterns put together. So here's kind of the quickie picture, just in case anyone's not completely familiar. This would be kind of a picture of point to multipoint. And the interesting thing that it says there in the lower left is that they really are sharing the data rate. So you have three, three radios out there, and you might have you know, this 100 megabit per second link. You want to think in terms of them sharing the uh, available throughput between them. If you really want to say, no, I don't want to share, I want them each to have a full dedicated 100 megabit per second, well, great. You'd install three point-to-point -point links, and at the main location, you'd actually have three antennas, which would likely have one of these directional uh, type of antennas on it. A panel was quite likely in the higher frequencies, maybe Yagi in the lower, and that allows you to, uh, to point and direct the energy very, very efficiently at, uh, in order to get those very long-range, higher data rate links. Um, it's kind of a picture of a repeater type system. Uh, the data is bounced between radios and allows you to get to some of those far-reaching locations, as you see up in the upper top area on the on the slide, that might be otherwise inaccessible on a on a star type of of um, you know uh, prior description, such as here where you, everybody can see the home base, and here there's ones that can't. So you have to repeater in and around things. All right. Uh, on the cryptographic side, um, it seems like everybody nowadays is claiming AES this and AES that. And that's great and all, but there are customers, particularly municipalities and some of the military folks that, uh, and even some of the industrial and commercial folks that are trying to do um, the credit card um, uh, standard for, oh crud, what's it called? There's a credit card standard for, for the new encryption um, Matterbrook, can you just type it in right there so I, I, I can recall what, which, what the name of it was. But the, uh, the, there's this thing called FIPS, and it's becoming really, really uh, a big deal uh, because it's a way that, the, that a manufacturer who makes uh, a radio product or other communication product can go to the government labs, uh, pay them a whole bunch of money, 
and they'll go and analyze your, your encryption algorithms and your encryption techniques and give you a stamp of approval saying that you are FIPS validated and, uh, and then you can use that approval and that, that, uh, that, that number that they grant you, um, much like an FCC ID for radio, it allows traceability and that traceability is what then uh, enables a, 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 a buyer, a purchaser and the procurer to guarantee that the encryption isn't just a nice word that says, oh, it's AES. No, 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 this is proven. It, it, it's not just AES, but it's been tested and shown to be uh, correct. Um, and lastly, I think on security, a lot of folks are actually doing encryption more at the application layer. It's, uh, it's becoming often the preferred technique where they're doing what's called SSL sessions, VLANs, VPNs. And these are, are ways that the, uh, that the data is actually handled for the encryption on the application layer rather than down lower with just the, the packet level uh, between the radio. You use both because often both are required uh, in some situations. But uh, it's nice to understand that there's two different uh, mechanisms and some of the uh, requirements that might be relevant in the, in the market that, uh, depending upon the market that you're in. All right, so easy, ease of sub. Well, this is, this is a huge deal because if it's not a super sophisticated installation or installer for that matter, oftentimes you know, the, the bid goes out and it's going to end up being installed by an electrician, which is great. But there's some super challenging hardware out there that is designed for a different kind of user base, you know, what, what's called wireless internet service providers. It's kind of a, a whole market of these guys that go out and try and provide internet services to uh, high value houses or businesses sometimes. And the equipment that these guys buy is very carrier uh, like. Uh, there's gobs of options, quite complex, very, very complex to, to configure. Uh, the deployment scenarios are quite straightforward and often the price is very cheap because a lot of these things are selling hardware into third world countries and the global demand for low cost, low cost WISP equipment has really driven some of the pricing down. You, you see some of the folks, uh, Ubiquity might be a, a good example in this regard, but they've made very, very inexpensive, uh, sometimes you know, pretty high performance gear. The challenge is, is, is the usability and the user interface can be nightmarish for, for uh, less sophisticated installers, and then that's that becomes a serious uh, limiting factor. Particularly, it, it might be nice that it's super cheap, but if it takes a lot of effort to deploy to figure out how to use it, much less the tech support isn't there to uh, to provide uh, the assistance in the configuration of the complexities of it. Uh, the old Motorola Canopy systems were horrible in the same regard. You know, there was no Motorola tech support number, and yet the configurability was was really tough. Um, so that's something to consider. Uh, you want to have great tech support. It's got to be installable um, by the, by the skill set that uh, that's available to uh, to make this these things happen. Um, ease of setup. Sometimes you'll see folks using very 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 narrow beam directional antennas that can be very tricky to align. Um, numbers you want to avoid is anything above about 23 dBi. If somebody's telling you you should use a 30 dBi run. Um, because it gets too hard to get the thing to uh, to get aligned, and you know a little bit of uh, of tower flex, you know, and all of a sudden the things coming and going in and out of alignment, and that's those are the things where it's like, oh, it's a windy day. Why isn't it working? It's because the tower's flexing, or the this big uh, antenna aperture, you know, big dish is 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 vibrating in the wind. You know, bad, bad, bad. Those are things that really can screw up your system and uh, and make you make folks scratch their head. Just 23 dBi and lower is. Uh, are the kind of numbers you want to see above that. It's it's a different kind of category of, of installation and installer that should be uh, looking up in, in, the, in the really high numbers. Okay, so easy use and reliability. Re reliability and deployability. Um, you don't want to do truck rolls every year when, uh, when that cheap $89 radio gets bugs into it because there's no good, um, uh, the, the holes are there for, for to get into or water to get into. It's a whole lot cheaper to install it once, have it last five or ten years, and not have to do another truck roll again, uh, given the truck rolls often cost more than the, uh, the electronics that are deployed. Um, just something to consider. Um, so we're pretty much at my last slide here, and this is the only one that gets kind of uh, a bit nerdier out of the whole bunch. And this is kind of just an analogy that, that kind of gives an idea as to how RF really kind of works behind the scenes. And it's, it's a great little slide here, if I can just explain it for just the last couple of minutes of the, 
uh, presentation. So all these things are related. You've got speed versus range, reliability versus channel width, and all these different parameters are like knobs on, a, you know, on, a, on, a, on, a, on the radio world. And each one that you twist, the different things happen. But it's pretty straightforward. Uh, a big one of them is, like I, like I mentioned before, the faster you go, the shorter the distance is going to be. And sometimes you're going to have you know, your reliability and whatnot. So it's always a balancing game to try and get fundamentally the, the, the right mix here. And often that's why it's so important to say, okay, how fast do I really need to go? Because if I can go a little slower, oftentimes I can make a more reliable system. So if you look here, it's all about what's called occupied bandwidth, okay? And that's this channel width thing. So if you look at the picture, I've got four different images shown there. Now the FCC only allows me a certain amount of output power, and I can take that output power and I can squish it into a nice narrow band like the one at the top. And that gives me a huge advantage because I'll be well above the noise floor, but I won't be able to go very fast because it's a real narrow uh, piece of spectrum. So I'm going to go further with it. I'm going to be more reliable because I'll be louder than the noise floor, um, but you lose the data rate. As you move down and down and down, the area under the curve, maybe I didn't draw it perfectly, right, but the area under the curve stays the same. Now I'm down at the 40 megahertz all the way down at the bottom, and, and, and what happens is it's really taken that same amount of power and it's pulled it really, really wide. Now, you get some awesome things from that. At shorter range, you can have some absurdly high available to you. Uh, the downside is is that you're really, really wide, so you can get poked at uh, uh, you know, with other interferers that might be available because there's just not as many channels. If you look at the FCC, they, you, know, they, you, you can only get you know, a, a more moderate number of channels in the spectrum they, they, they allow you. Um, like, at, for example, 900 megahertz, you only have 28 uh, megahertz available to you, 902 to 928, uh, 26 megahertz. So you can't, you can't fit very many of these things in there if you go with one of those 20 megahertz deals. Um, it just is only going to fit one, and that's just a, a very interference-prone uh, uh, mindset. You'll, you'll kind of get hammered on pretty hard. Up at 5.8, um, you, know, you can do nine of those 20 megahertz wide channels, and that's a lot. That, that gives you a lot of ability and a lot of flexibility. And you know the 40 megahertz wide ones, well, you can go a lot of data rate, your ranges are going to be shorter, so it's always this balance between how fast do I need and what is it that's going to get the job done the best. So with that in mind, um, this is kind of the magic that, uh, that the pre-sales guys are always trying to balance in their head going, well, he says he needs half a gigabit per second. Well, crud, that's going to be really hard at the range they're requesting. Um, so it's it's... It's always one of those balancing things that sometimes requires a little extra customer education, but this one slide often will will uh, will give that uh, give those insights. So I've got two minutes to go. Um, let me just say thank you very much for the time that uh, that folks were able to take with us today, just to hear a little bit more about uh, in general wireless technology, maybe some of the different ideas and, and product uh, concepts that we try to offer into the marketplace. Uh, the, the only one that I didn't cover in this slide deck is cellular. We'll have a different presentation coming up just about cellular and how it fits into these type of topologies in a later uh, presentation. I think it might be in a couple of weeks. But if there's interest in talking to the sales guys, information's there. Uh, Pre-sales, post-sales, uh, we're always here to help and we're delighted to have. And we, we really specialize in trying to treat customers the way we want to be treated. And by getting them to not just be successful, but be successful enough that they want to buy again. Um, and with that, um, we've got time for questions. If anybody, I'll stick around as long as folks want. Um, any questions I might be able to help folks with at this time? Well, um, if anyone uh, thought of some questions along the way, but they'd rather just ask uh, on a one-to-one -one basis, again, uh, the telephone number's there. Uh, my name's Mike Derby. If, if the sales or support guys uh, need to, they'll route you in and, and uh, pull me in if there's uh, some advanced projects that you might be working on. Otherwise, once again, I uh, sure appreciate your time today and look forward to hopefully helping you out and, uh, and having you as a customer in the future. Thanks. <laughs>